some of the things that we have made intentional uh, was in the name, uh, Kronos Agency. So Kronos is a mm-hmm. is a play of words on the, uh, I would say, Greek god of time. And that kind of stemmed from my belief of being in control of the time, the very limited time that we have on, on Earth. And it's being able to, to gift someone else that same ability to control their time and what they want to do uh, is really powerful. You're listening to Ecomonics, a Debutify podcast. Your resource for one-of-a-kind insights into the world of e-commerce and business in the modern age. This is Joseph. I'll be presenting a wealth of industry knowledge from interviews with successful business people and our own state-of-the-art research. Your time is valuable, so let's go. Joshua Chin of Kronos.Agency brings to the table a yearning for freedom, measured in time that he saves for others. In this episode of Ecomonics, a Debutify podcast, we talk strategy about email marketing, getting the best returns out of a Q4 unlike any in history, and the importance of company culture. There is plenty to look forward to. The key is that you're looking forward. Joshua Chin, good to have you here. Thank you so much for being on Ecomonics, a Debutify podcast. Joseph, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. It's a pleasure. Yeah, I, as I uh, mentioned right before I hit record, each and every one of them has been exciting. I don't see any reason why this one would be any different. So let's fire this up with the most important question that we have to ask to get everything going is who are you and what do you do? Yeah, I'm Joshua Chin. My friends call me Josh. I am the co-founder and CEO of Crow's Agency. We are an email marketing agency. We help high growth e-commerce brands take things to the next level with email. And that's kind of what we've been up to for the past three and a half ish years right now. We've been loving it and we've been, we've had the luxury and the privilege of, of working with some of the, the fastest growing brands in the world. We've served over 200 brands. And with that comes a lot of pretty interesting experiences that I would love to mm-hmm. share a little bit more about. And the whole team is remote. So I guess that's also quite a fun little uh, trivia or fact. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, we're the same way at to, at Debutify. We have uh, people in New Zealand, Australia. Nice. I want to start pulling countries out of randomly. Oh, UK. We got we got a guy in the UK. Uh, we got guys <laughs> in India. Uh, the, the, the the hard part, and maybe you'll uh, you can attest to this too. But coordinating meetings is a bit tricky because people are on varying time zones, and so somebody ends yeah. up having to draw the, the the short straw, so to speak. Yeah, it's it's always hard. I mean, we. For quite quite a long time, we've only had kind of two major time zones to work around, which was the U.S., the the American time zones, mostly Eastern time zones, uh, and and Asia, which is my time in Singapore, which is currently kind of the flip side to to Eastern time. But we recently added a bunch of people in the European time zone, like the U.K. time. So that's that's a bit hard. Yeah, that's the tricky one. And I, I cannot even begin to imagine... Australian and New Zealand, that's even further away. So how, how do you make it work? Well, I have the, uh, I, I'm blanking on the exact name for it, but it's like, it's a time converting system. Uh, and we use Slack as our communication method. And so what I Same. do is when I, when I'm looking at somebody on their profile, it does say what their time zone is. And I'm a chronic finger counter. I'm 30 years old and I still count with my fingers. So, <laughs> okay. Okay, it's it's nine p.m. from there, and it's uh, six p.m. for me here. So six to seven, seven yeah. to eight, eight to, oh, geez, eight to nine. Okay, 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 cool. And so we work that out. Like I said, sometimes somebody just has to draw the the short the, straw. I'm sorry. Yeah, true. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's. I think with with that, that's just one of the few, I guess, downsides of being a globally just distributed remote team. The upside, I think, uh, is far. Uh, far more enticing and far more exciting to businesses. Yeah, I- incidentally, because I also work on uh, solo episodes too, so it gives me time to do my own research. And the most recent episode that I was working on was actually looking at the pros and cons of remote work. 
And mm. the, the pros really do outweigh the cons, but there are a couple of ones. And I guess you can speak to them too, because you're, you're fully remote. One of the cons, I guess one of the major ones that stuck out is that if there is an issue, they characterize it as a crisis. If the person mm. that you need to resolve it is still asleep at 3 a.m., there's a lot of downtime between him getting on and the fire continuing to rage. I don't know if you've, if you've encountered any issues like that where something really could have been stood to have been repaired within six hours, but you, you had to wait an additional eight for that. Yeah, absolutely. But they're far and few between, I think. Yeah, it's not super common. And I, I think that we kind of anticipate that. And when it does happen, we, we kind of know what to do. Mm-hmm. And the escalation structures does help a little bit. Like if we can get to this person, someone else is available in this time oh, zone. So it, it does help. It's not perfect, I, I don't think, but it overcomes some of that limitations. But ideally, we just don't end up in a crisis. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, because the, the article that I'm looking at, I mean, it's hypothetical, right? But well, obviously a company ha- is considering these things uh, in advance. Uh, so they're more prepared for it. Absolutely. So that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it is something to definitely look out for. So one of the things that I, I wanted to ask from you mentioned from your introduction is, uh, and by the way, we'll, we'll get back to the company culture, but uh, we're on an hour's budget. So I want to make sure we get some uh, really important stuff here as well. Not that the other stuff isn't important, but here's here's me on my sixth walnut breakfast. So you mentioned it was, you're working with the high growth clients. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. So that sounds to me like there's like a threshold or there's a certain criteria that you look into for people that you're working with. So uh, let's just say that a potential client is listening right now. I know you also have like a four-step process that you deploy from uh, meeting them to delivering on results. So let me let me hear more about that. What do clients need to be ready? And then what are they going to expect once they start working with you? Yeah. Absolutely. So we typically work with clients that are at uh, the one mil mark in annual revenue and above. The reason for that is at that stage, companies are typically thinking about growing and scaling uh, versus surviving. It's kind of um, an arbitrary measure. So we do have clients on both sides of the that, that benchmark. And actually, most of our clients are above that. The whole idea is that when a brand is ready to kind of switch things to high gear, uh, it often means that resources and infrastructure are lagging behind their growth. In e growth is kind of like fast. <laughs> it's, it's like yeah. a hockey stick type of growth. So yeah. uh, we we bridge that gap in terms of where they want to be uh, in their profits and their back-end marketing and where they're at currently. So that's the reason why we typically only work with... Uh, 1 million plus businesses. So the, the process that we can go through with clients start with a, a discovery. Uh, so mm-hmm. discovery kind of entails us doing the research, us extracting as much information as we can from our clients. Uh, and that kind of sets the foundation for everything else that we're going to be building upon. So that often happens before or very early on in the, the, the relationship. And once that is out of the way, we'll have a bunch of kind of documentations, uh, branding guidelines, copy guides, branding personas, and stuff like that, uh, that we then use to strategize. And we then map out the strategy using one of our many frameworks uh, around email, backend marketing, the customer uh, customer journey, Mm -hmm. retention marketing, and stuff like that. So that gives us a a big picture of what we're going to be building, sort of like the blueprint. The third step is executing and executing on the mm-hmm. blueprint. Uh, and that takes anywhere from 30 to 60 days, uh, depending on the complexity of that blueprint. And then it doesn't end there. The last stage is optimization and optimize. So uh, that's when we take what has already been built. We run data through it, right? With traffic that's flowing. We often identify additional opportunities, challenges that we can then mitigate through split tests, additional uh, emails uh, and plugging leaks and gaps and mm-hmm. that's kind of the, the entire relationship and that can span across a short-term project but most of the time the most results and outcome typically comes from a long-term engagement and a relationship that we build with clients and that's why i like to use the term 
partnership more so mm-hmm. than a client agency relationship because that's really what it is. Yeah, I mean, I felt that same way, not to the same scale or anything, but prior to working with Debutify as a freelancer, I would go client by client basis. And yeah, you know, you get to into, into more personal relationship with them. And even speaking from a pragmatic sense, you know, being their friend, being somebody that they can turn to, being a trusted advisor yeah. uh, helps boost their their loyalty because they realize how much additional value they're going to get out of somebody that gives them the full package. Absolutely. Now, in addition to them meeting the uh, financial threshold, uh, you said sometimes it can be like a little bit under a million, but you know, w- in one way or another, they're definitely past, like you said, they're past the survival phase. Is there any other major criteria that a, a potential partner should have at the ready? Is there any other reason why you might say uh, you guys might not be the best fit for us? Yeah, if traffic is an issue, if generating traffic is uh, is a problem, that's typically not a good time to start. But there are instances where we do take on clients, despite the fact uh, that's when we are really excited about the brand, mm-hmm. or if we really believe in the idea behind what they're trying to build, uh, and that's kind of instances where we are taking a bet on investing in that relationship Uh, because truth be told the first month of the engagement is typically kind of break even on from a financial standpoint for for the agency either break even or a very thin margin Uh, and most of the value add that we bring to the table and the value add that we are able to capture in terms of retainer happens from the subsequent months on onwards so that's the reason why we tend to shy away from just project work. But in yeah, in some cases, when we do believe in the brand so much that uh, we want to be a part of it and we kind of mm-hmm. uh, want to be the supporting hero that makes mm-hmm. the brand a success. And I observe too, just for looking at your website, is you obviously understand the value of branding because your company put the time in to make a compelling brand yourself. What I identified is the color scheme, the warm, cold color scheme, the blues and the oranges. It's very popular in film. If you look at a lot of posters, uh, many of them will use uh, blues and oranges to convey almost like a cycle of energy. There's a warmth and then there's a cooling off, a warmth and a cooling off. But that's the only one that I can spot. Uh, aside from that, what else uh, went into your brand to, uh, to make it so effective? That's actually something that I did not intentionally think about. It's, it's subconscious. That's the point, especially in film. It's just one of those things that is so ingrained in the, in the human experience yeah. that it's effective. It's a, it's a sense of flow. And I couldn't mm-hmm. exactly pen that thought down on you. You put it into it. So that's, that's pretty cool. Thanks. Thanks for that, Joseph. Yeah. Um, Good deed done. You're welcome. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I think with, as far as our brand is built, it's, it hasn't entirely been... 100% intentional. And I think that's the, the way that a lot of businesses have been built. It's, it hasn't been 100% uh, conscious. So some of the things that we have made intentional uh, was in the name, uh, Kronos Agency. So Kronos is a, mm-hmm. is a play of words on the, uh, I would say, Greek god of time. Yes, Greek, Greek god of time. Kronos with a, with a K. And that kind of stemmed from my belief of being in control of the time, the very limited time that we have on on Earth. And it's that sense of being able to to gift someone else that same ability to control their time and what they want to do uh, is really powerful. That's what we're trying to do with with Kronos and uh, the work that we do. So when we work with a client, everything is done by us from copied content to creatives and strategy. So on average, our clients spend about maximum of two, one to two hours per week in kind of communication and collaboration with, with us and everything else is done by us. And typically we spend up to a hundred hours per client per month. And that's, that's a lot of time in the agency world. And um, that's kind of where we add the most value and creating that freedom for, for our clients to say, I don't want to spend this much time on something that I'm not you know, 100% interested in. That's when we step in and we say, why not let's do that for you 
going to create not just a lot of time for you, but a lot of profits that you can then use to further your growth or do whatever you want to do with that additional uh, sum of resources and money. Yeah. I mean, I can see that by conveying the passion that you have for the work that you're doing and also the passion for the results, the passion for the freedom that you deliver with people. It puts their mind at ease. Yeah. Yeah, a absolutely. I think it, it, we, we don't say it much, but I think it shows in, in the work that we do. And I think that's, that's all that matters. So you were so excited to, to work with these brands. And I know you mentioned uh, off the bat, uh, you'd be excited to talk about them. And so I want to give you that chance. What are some of the standout brands that you really feel like you've made a, a significant difference by working with them? So one that comes to mind is a beauty brand, a beauty slash cosmetics brand. And uh, they have been kind of hovering in the 100 to 200K in monthly revenue range and generating about less than 8% of that from emails. And repeat purchase rates were at about 4%. That was in late 2018 when, they, when we first started working with them. And obviously, that, there was a lot, work, a lot of work to do. Uh, and it's with a business that has a 4% repeat purchase rate. Uh, it's not as stable as most would want it to be. Uh, mm -hmm. So when we came in, we looked at that and we, we saw that repeat purchase rates were uh, the biggest issue. Email was done in the best way possible. So when we came in, we looked at the automations that we created, uh, what were basically kind of missing in terms of the customer's journey. And we kind of mapped it out in terms of a, a framework that we've kind of came up with uh, from basically different sources of ideas. And we identified a couple of gaps in between the initial subscription, right, lead capture to conversion. So there, we think of the uh, email systems in a couple of phases, the lead capture to conversion, and then from conversion to retention and retention to uh, sunset, which is kind of the, the end of life cycle stage. So between subscription to conversion, it starts with the conversion on the lead capture form, which is a pop-up. We realized that there was a huge gap in terms of what conversions could be versus what it currently was. What we basically did was a bunch of split tests, realigned the whole, the, the whole brand with its uh, identity, the copy, graphics and everything, making sure that everything looks and feels the same, uh, no matter what stage of the mm -hmm. customer is at with the brand. Um, when, we've, when we did that change, uh, what started happening was the pop-ups started converting twice as well on desktop and 20 times as well on mobile. So that was a huge difference. And that came down to a couple of things. Number one, the way pop-ups were triggered. Initially, it was kind of just a, an exit intent pop-up, and that was the case for, for the longest time. Uh, and that's typically mm -hmm. the default for most brands. Uh, we decided to kind of switch things up a little bit and uh, tested that against a scroll trigger, where in, uh, when the page is scrolled by 60%, a pop-up is triggered. Ah, okay. That worked essentially 20 times better than the exit intent. And yeah, so the hypothesis worked, worked out. We realized that people who scrolled through the content page typically indicated sufficient interest to then convert uh, into a subscriber. So that worked out super well. The timing was right. And then we kind of continued on that same philosophy across the entire uh, buying journey. And we ended up in a, in a matter of, well, it took, it took us a long time, but it was meaningful. It took us about a year uh, to get to where we want to be. And um, today we are generating about 20 plus percent of their total revenue with emails, but more importantly, about 20%, 20 to 30% of their total revenue is coming from repeat customers today. So that's a, that adds a, an additional layer of stability and profits to the company that wouldn't be there in the first place. So that's really the impact of what email can do. And what that essentially means is it, it basically gave the founders a, a new source of income that they can then use to reinvest in other channels. So today they have more than just Facebook and Instagram. They have Facebook, Instagram. Uh, I'm not sure if Snap is still a, a channel for them, but they experimented with Snap. And they managed to experiment with a lot more channels that they otherwise would not have 
the resources and time to to do. And that kind of take, took things to the next level. And today they're, they're an eight-figure brand who's still a client. That's amazing. I mean, exit intent, it makes sense as a default. And even one of the most loyal of customers will eventually want to exit a page. So I, I can see why it works as a, as a foundation or as kind of like a the go-to. Uh, but makes sense. Yeah. When you, when you, when you, yeah, when we, when you realize that other people are going to be scrolling down and they have an interest for it, uh, that makes sense as well. Are there any other, I, I don't want to say triggers cause that word, whew, that word has a legacy to it, but are there <laughs> other methods to identify or, or other ways you can implement a pop-up? So maybe if somebody is like, Let's just say, for instance, there's a massive wall of text and someone is reading it and they're engaged in it. Like you can tell maybe if somebody is reading that thing. And so they're obviously uh, fixated on the content itself or if there's a video and people are watching for a certain amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so time based triggers are, are, are work pretty well as a, as a trigger. Uh, we typically look at the time spent on. So we typically just focus on the top three landing pages on the website and we'll look at the time spent on average. Uh, prior to a bounce. So that's typically reflected on Google Analytics or Shopify. And we'll take that stat and we'll kind of take a 10% discount or a slight discount on the average time. For example, if it's if uh, people typically spend two minutes on it, we would set the trigger to go off at a, about 100 seconds instead. And that works really well, especially if it is a content page where it's like a blog or a video uh, embedded in it or, or stuff like that. Uh, if it's a product page, the scroll works a lot better because it's a lot more imagery. People kind of engage with images in a very different way versus mm -hmm. text or, or video. So what I recommend is uh, do a split test. If the pop-up software allows for that, do a split test between, between the two and see what works. Uh, but the hypothesis would probably stand in those cases. Excellent. Uh, there was another case study uh, that I wanted to ask you about because uh, I went through your YouTube page and saw some of your testimonials or uh, case studies as you as you refer to them. Treeks or high tech? Do you recall that one? Yeah. Yeah. So that one stood out to me because the revenue increase was five hundred percent. Yeah. And I don't know how to quantify that. So uh, I, I want to hear about that story and how did you guys manage to get 500% revenue? Absolutely. So tricks or high tech, uh, they are, they're actually a company that they're quite a big company, uh, at, at their peak, I think they had about 300 employees, I think, and they essentially built, uh, niche brands and the logistics system behind it was basically a drop shipping type of system. So they scale pretty quickly and they're able to kind of move very, very quickly. And all they needed was a good margin, a good profit margin to go along with that scale so that they can then reuse that money to reinvest in growth. Before they start, started working with us, they essentially had kind of plug and play, typical what, what you see is what you get kind of uh, emails. And it's, it's not the most ideal because you want a system that is able to scale with traffic, right? And it's not just take this template, plug it into your email software, or just install this app, this card abandonment app, and you're good to go kind of a thing. That would bring us to maybe like one ten percent of its full potential of what email can do for the business. But if you really want to take things to the next level and maximize what email can do for, for your business, uh, it has to be customized. So that's what we did. So we essentially built custom strategies for each uh, each of their brands. And we found what was the best converting strategy across the brands. And we experimented with uh, and kind of duplicated that across the different brands uh, with basically custom branding and, and copy and stuff like that. Um, so that turned out very, very well. It turns out that in, in their industry, uh, which was fashion and apparel, uh, email works extremely well. And they had an incredibly loyal audience who were you know, people who were willing to buy again and again from, from them. And they had great service as well. So 
the reason why we're able to kind of 5x their, their business as a direct impact from email was because email contributed to more than one third of their total revenue at that point in time, essentially. So essentially what ended up happening was it compounded month and month to a point where they went from high seven figures as a business to beyond eight figures, essentially low mid eight figures. So that's, that's always fun. <laughs> you know, you, you reminded me of, uh, back when I would have to like, you know, go with my mom somewhere or you know, I'd be sitting in the waiting room. Um, and I would get to see like a fashion magazine, a uh, hairstylist appointment or whatever. And this, this is me being very young. And I would flip through these fashion magazines and there wasn't any content. You would almost think that it was just like advertisement after advertisement. There's just like a book of ads. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I think it's a breath of fresh air in this uh, new era because uh, people who are into fashion, they're obviously drawn to the visual, mm -hmm. obviously, but they're also drawn to some of the insights that I don't think I, I mean, to be fair, I don't exactly uh, gobble up fashion magazines or anything, but for emails to actually provide insightful content, something that they can sink their teeth into and read, I think goes a long way for that industry. Yeah. And, and here, here's the thing. It starts uh, not from the content in and of itself. It starts with the audience and understanding who your audience or audiences are. And that stems from proper segmentation. And segmentation comes from understanding what comprises your demographics in your audience. Uh, if you're able to identify clear categories of people who have distinct needs, desires, wants, and fears, you can then create a content strategy that's hyper relevant for that group of people. And the limitations are, is, is it's really endless in, in terms of what you can achieve with this. But the, the practical limitation is basically just how much time and the ROI you get on your time. For, for, from doing all of that stuff. Uh, so we typically look at basically the top segments, the top identified interest groups, for example, especially if the business has distinct products, product lines or products and services. It helps to categorize people in, in, a, in a unique way uh, that we can then deliver content that's hyper-targeted for that group of uh, people. There was a question that I had. I had it ch uh, chambered because when we were talking about Kronos' own, uh, own motif and how I characterize something for you that you needed me to, to tell you so that you can make a new connection in your head. And I'm wondering if you've done that for somebody else, but let me explain to you my philosophy on this is that you have the company and you have the people who work for the company and then you have the entity and it almost becomes like a spiritual thing where the entity, the brand itself begins to represent something that even the company doesn't realize that it was representing or it's so powerful that it goes beyond what the people are and like to me the, the the company that would stick out to me in this is nintendo like it doesn't matter who's working for it obviously there's some important people who work for the company shigeru miyamoto but the entity itself is so important so when you're working with these brands have you ever spotted something or noticed something about them that maybe they didn't realize they were doing there there, there has been cases but i think that the, the thing about chronos is that we're, we're we're still relatively young as a business mm -hmm. and we're, we're not at our peak yet. So the, the identity of the brand is kind of still tied heavily to the work that we do and, and to me. And that's kind of hard to decouple at this point in time. Okay. Well, to be fair, I just wanted to make sure that I'm asking more about like the people that you've worked with, but your, your story is also compelling as well. Yeah. So w what I'm trying to say is it's, um, it, it often comes down to the impact that we have and what that impact means to the, the, the business and the clients that we work with, uh, rather than looking at Kronos Agency as a, as a brand or as an entity and having an emotional thought about that. Most likely because it, we, we are a service provider uh, and until mm -hmm. I, I believe that until we reach a certain scale of influence, uh, it's very difficult for people to envision what it would be like to work with us until they actually worked with us. There are mm -hmm. obviously aspirations of what uh, working with us looks like. And I think that th most of that comes from within the, the clients more so than it does on Kronos Agency as a brand, if that makes sense. 
It does. And also there are more pathways to, to get to that point, especially because of social media. You can convey a lot about the company through the images that you take of it. And I mean, that was to me, that was really one of the major takeaways uh, doing my, my research for this is how really how happy people seem to be working uh, for the company. So I, I, I almost want to put a lid in that just for a second, because there's a, a couple of other things that I wanted to make sure I, I got to. Uh, one of them is I always want to make sure that I cover everybody who's part of the dropshipping council, which uh, you mentioned in your uh, when we when we got your questionnaire back, you said, yes, you're a member of the dropshipping council. So what's your place in that? What is it that you bring to the council? How did you get into it? So the dropshipping council is actually, a, they're, they're a pretty new organization. I'm not a co-founder or anything. I'm a, I would say I'm, I'm a, a con contributor to the content. So what they're trying to achieve at the, the dropshipping council is basically creating a community of dropshippers who are taking the business seriously because they're, dropshipping is such a, a wide term that uh, at, at its base, there are lots of people trying to make it happen, make it work, but there are people who are taking it seriously as a career. That's kind of the, I guess, the, a peer to peer type of network that they're trying to create, wherein everybody's aligned with one another in terms of what they're trying to achieve with the business. Uh, they're open to sharing what they know and they believe in the greater power of, of a network of people who are like-minded. So it's it's kind of unique in that sense because dropshipping is traditionally, I guess, a, a relatively opaque industry where people are kind of like hiding secrets from one another and keeping things mm -hmm. themselves. But more and more so, that's kind of fading away today where we see lots of really good content and information being shared. The history of dropshipping, I think, is a little bit darker where lots of fraud and scam has happened and I'm not sure. It probably is still happening, but I think what people are trying to do here at, at the council is they're trying to shed a little bit of a light at what what's happening in the industry and the right path to follow. So yeah, I think that's basically all that I can <laughs> kind of say about that. Well, I, I appreciate characterizing it as light. Yeah, because I'm, I'm not a dropshipper my, myself. I, I actually started out dropshipping on eBay. That's kind of how I got, that's how I tasted blood on the online uh, marketing <laughs> world. But uh, that was a very kind of long time ago and it was nothing substantial. Yeah, well, I have this uh, little bit of like a recurring campaign because I speak to so many members and contributors of the council mm -hmm. that uh, in, in my head, being a massive nerd, as I picture like a round table, like a Knights of the Round with a King <laughs> Arthur figure. and each per So uh, I'm yeah. encouraging each and every one of you to figure out like uh, what part of the, the, the Knights of the Round you fit in and what role you would play. That's my little, my little seed I planted in your mind and I hope it goes somewhere. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. So... Let's get into your company culture because that's a big deal. The, the biggest deal to me that I see is, you, and I know you guys aren't doing it right now because of the COVID-19 situation, but you guys had uh, workcations, uh, yeah. work vacation. And especially as a remote company where we don't really get to like have those, um, those incubation periods of people getting together in a room and bouncing ideas off of each other. I, I, I do miss that. You know, I'm spending a lot of time in my apartment. So I'd like to hear about not just why it's appealing from the vacation front, but also why it's appealing from the work front. Yeah, absolutely. So the vacations, man, I, I, I really do miss that. Um, and traveling in general. I actually haven't seen my family in close to 10 months now, I think. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. It's, no, it's actually, wait, nine months. Yeah, nine months since, uh, since January. But yeah. So vacations, they're super important, I, I think, uh, for any remote team to grow, scale, and stay aligned. I think meeting up in person in, a, in any shape or form is, I think, highly beneficial. We, we got the idea, well, at least I got the idea from, uh, from a company called Automatic. Uh, they run WordPress, WooCommerce, and a couple of other pretty cool companies. Um, they are a fully remote team as well. Uh, a team far bigger than we are, I think at least 10 times bigger than uh, we are. So they have uh, quarterly get-togethers. I'm not sure what they call them anymore, but essentially get gatherings of people in, uh, in, in, a, in a similar region. Uh, 
uh, that the company funds. Uh, we're small enough to kind of gather everybody in the same location, so that's what we do. But it's yeah, it's, it it still is getting harder and harder as as we grow. Uh, it's super important because it, it realigns everyone on the same mission uh, and the vision and and the the purpose of why we do what we do. And often that's very hard to achieve solely from one hour Zoom meetings every week or even every day. Uh, it's not always the the most effective meeting there there is value in kind of meeting a person shaking hands hugging and um just connecting in person and that's what we try to do so that's kind of the foundational reason the why we have locations but on, on top of that obviously it's fun right meeting everyone that you work mm-hmm. with for such a long time and finally you get to meet them in person uh, that's always a fun thing and it's it also helps kind of create a bond that we then build upon in the in the virtual world, the online bond is very different from what you can build in in person, and that's what we found. So, we also conduct uh, mini strategy sessions for specific teams. So we we are a team of about uh, seventy odd people today, and it's we're kind of teamed up in in, in account account teams where where there is a manager, uh, a couple of account executives. Who then report to a an operations manager? Who then report to my COO, uh, and my co-founder? So we kind of create uh, create like little activities uh, and strategy sessions to come up with new, fresh ideas on how we can add further further add value to a client. Then the the, the marketing channels that we work in that's email, SMS, and, and uh, messenger marketing. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, we also have like a broad overview of where the company is headed towards. And we often get inputs and discussions from from people on often very controversial topics, uh, and that's always very effective uh, in creating better engagement with the people that we work with. And it's kind of easy to lose that sense of being a part of a team and, and being engaged in, in work, especially when people are so far apart, and you're kind of just logging into a virtual. Uh, network of a a room so having that activity that definitely helps Mm -hmm. i like traveling so visiting a new location every location is always fun for me personally and i think a lot of people find it enjoyable as well so it's kind of like a perk yeah i mean i I haven't been much of a traveler myself and I, I think being uh, confined even more so than i usually am is starting to eat away at me to the point where as soon as I can travel, I think I'm, I'm going to want to do that. The other thing too, is that when I would first start, like, let's just say like a job at a grocery store, which I, which I've done, there's a lot of sensory information that conveys to myself subconsciously that this is a place of work and that there's a level of seriousness that I have to take this. Mm-hmm. And so when I, when I remember my first day as a grocery clerk, uh, and they took me into the back room where all the magic happens, you know? All, all, all of the product that we're holding for customers so they can come up to us and say, do you have any more of this in the back? Yeah, we, we, we were totally holding stuff in the back just so that we can wait for customers to ask us that question. Um, anyways, and it, it was it was such a raw experience. Uh, there's people moving around in the forklift and, and boxes all over the place and other people and nodding, sh- uh, meeting, shaking hands and, 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 and water coolers. And I mean, it's a lot to take in, but it conveys that this is a job. Yeah. And it conveys the reality of it. And it can be difficult to, to to have that same experience when I could minimize my work tab and open up Dota. Yeah. To all, in, all in the span of like two seconds. Yeah. Not that I do. I mean, you know, I'm going to get my job done. Do. But <laughs> having the ability to do it. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Uh, so it's... Nah. And so being able to, to go and meet with people in person is... Uh, it, it conveys that sense of this is this is what I'm doing to contribute to the greater good. Yeah, and this is real. Uh, it gives a sense of uh, tangibleness, tangibility to to the whole tangibility. Yeah, yeah, to to the whole um, experience. And and I I often say this: if if you're going to be spending seventy percent of your waking adult waking life at, at something and that's typically work it has to be something that's good and you you have to be engaged in it and if, if you're not it's it's such a waste of just life 
in general in time. Mm -hmm. We try to create opportunities beyond just locations. We, we try to create opportunities for, the, for that to happen. Uh, and it's, it's really difficult because, you know, coming into culture from an ideals point of view, it's easy to say we want to create the most uh, flexible work environment that there, there possibly can be. But in reality, as an agency, as a service provider who, who's uh, responsible for, for the outcome of clients that may rely on this for a big proportion of their business, Mm -hmm. It can be very daunting when your team members are, are saying, I'm going to take the, the whole week off. Right. Or I'm going to, you know, I, I have to be offline uh, tomorrow. Or even I have to be offline in an hour's time. That, that kind of uh, takes away, I guess, the effectiveness of a flexible work environment because then the outcome doesn't get achieved in the first place. So ideals and reality often doesn't match is what I what I've come to to find. And often an ideal is an ideal for a reason and we have to kind of take steps to to get there. So in, in our context, flexibility and the, the freedom to find the path that you want to take to get to the objectives that you're responsible for often means it comes with certain restrictions and parameters that we have set in place like being accountable mm -hmm. for it, where you are. You have the freedom to go offline, but you can't just say, I'm going to go offline right now and just disappear for the rest of the day. Yeah, so things like that are still, on one hand, people come in with the expectation of, I have full reign over my work life and I have complete work life uh, autonomy. And what they come to realize is that, hold on, there are rules and policies that kind of prevent me from doing what I want because of responsibilities and to, to my team and to my client. I don't like mm -hmm. this anymore. And that's kind of the struggle that we face. And it's not sure. easy, yeah. I recognize that. I mean, one of the reasons why I was really happy to sign on to Debutify is that, you know, in Ricky Hayes's job posting, one of the most important values was honesty and transparency. And I try to abide by that as best I can. And I certainly haven't worked in any position of this scale. Right to to interview people whose time is highly valuable. You know, I used to interview comedians, not just comedians, but comedians in Canada. So needless to say, they their time wasn't as valuable, <laughs> and uh, they, they're not going to be upset with me at that. But uh, well, you know, bring it on, guys. So what I realized after being with the company at least for about five months so far is that I do have freedom in the sense that if I wanted to finish a script on a Wednesday instead of a Tuesday, I can. I have mm -hmm. deadlines. The deadlines have to be met. Yeah. But coming from the uh, from more the employee side as opposed to the CEO side is that I'm still disciplining myself just as much as if I had to show up for a shift. I've been consistently getting up early in the morning where before when I was strictly just freelancing, I, I got up whenever I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But I've restricted my my sleep schedule so now it's always i'm going to bed around 11 always getting up around 8 mm -hmm. and then obviously re recordings i can't miss those so those yeah. are something that is tangible and is real and is serious and i have yeah. to be there for those it is from the employee side too is to realize that w oh my god i can't believe i'm saying this with the freedom comes the responsibility <laughs> nice that sounds familiar yeah 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 <laughs> i totally agree with that and so my kind of ideal kind of uh, it, it evolved from do whatever you want as long as you achieve your object your objectives to set clear deadlines, set clear outcomes that, that you're trying to achieve and achieve them. You know, I'm not too worried about how you get there as long as you get there. Mm -hmm. To today, wherein a single individual is rarely fully responsible for a single outcome. It's often a team that's responsible for an outcome. So when, when that's the case, the collaboration that needs to occur between the different team members becomes too high paced to properly quantify in single tasks where you have clear defined outcomes, clear defined deadlines for each mini task. It's too hard to do that anymore. So it's much more mm -hmm. efficient and effective for the entire team to be available in the same time for the same task or for the same outcome rather. 
So that's kind of yeah. the, the place that we're at right now. Yeah, that makes sense. Because if the team needs to rely on each other, you wouldn't want to parse out the necessary back and forth, the necessary dialogue over the course of a week. They need to uh, all have that dialogue within the time frame. So that makes sense. Exactly, yeah. There was one last point that I wanted to just make about um, like the workation, because I think it's important to point out too, just in the grander scheme of how we can best uh, deploy or best use our time or best enjoy our time is that being there, I assume, is great. Uh, and that feeling of elation after it's over is also great too. But I think the most important part is the anticipation. And the reason why is because having something that positive to look forward to improves a person's mood because optimism is why I think where people's energy comes from. Like if somebody's working out, right? They're optimistic towards their results and they're and they're almost borrowing their energy from their future self. I, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. And I, I think that's a, that's, that's a big, actually in, in a lot of my one-on-ones, uh, well, prior to, to the pandemic, that's actually what people often tell me that I often ask, you know, what, what are you looking forward to in the next quarter on, on a personal note? I, I hear vocational a lot in, in those uh, conversations. <laughs> And that, that makes sense. And I think it's something that people can look forward to despite the hard times, challenges, or whatever that they're facing on a, in a, in a, on a micro level and day-to-day level. So I agree that that adds an additional kind of layer of benefit, I would say, to the, to mm-hmm. the team. I'm, I'm glad we both agree on that. Not that I thought there was going to be a, a different outcome or anything. No, I don't. I, I hate that idea. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but you're just doing it for your for your employees. All right. Well, you know that's that's noble of you. Um, so we're 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 closing around to uh, a wrap up time. But I, I did have one other particular strategy that I was personally curious about, having read through all of the the works you had sent us. It, it was in regards to discounting. Obviously, like discounting, it, it's supposed to be like the bread and butter tactic in order to close a sale. Uh, I know because yeah. I've done sales, and uh, in a lot of cases. If I just five percent off, but it's going to be final sale. You know, it's it's supposed to be an arrow in our quiver. But yeah. what you guys have done is you've made the case that it doesn't always reflect well on the value of the company to give away the discount right away. Can you go through what your uh, your thought process is and what's an alternative to discounting that uh, that you guys go with? Yeah, it, it really comes down to the identity of the brand and what the who the audience is, but it it doesn't mean that discounting is always bad or it's always good. Of course. It really comes down to uh, firstly understanding what the marketing strategy of the brand is. How do they want to initiate the relationship? How do you want to start building that relationship with a, with a customer? Some brands are much more focused on the initial sale and they'll do whatever it takes to make that initial conversion because they know that once mm-hmm. someone has experienced that product, they're going to love it and retention is going to be super high. This is very typical of subscription uh, type products, uh, supplements, um, beauty products like and stuff like that. So in those cases, an initial pretty crazy discount works super well. Uh, in some other cases where you want to protect the brand value, a good example, I'm, I'm not sure if they still do this, but if you look at movement watches or MVMT, they, uh, in, in their pop-up form, they do not offer anything of any significant value. It's kind of just sign up for the latest product uh, updates, the most generic thing you, you ever hear from a pop-up form. But it works for them. I, I'm presuming that it works for them because they are a wildly successful e-commerce brand. And the reason I think that that worked out really well for them, despite not having any discount code, and I think that, and not having any clear return of value for an email is because of just how strong their brand identity is and how much of an influence they are in people's lives. So in, I'm, I'm presuming in their case, their strategy is start things off with providing content and building a brand story of why movement watches should be a part of a person's life and by doing so they are taking discounts and the price itself out of the equation this price in it's relatively low i would say in, in the grand scheme of things 
with watches. Uh, so they kind of understand that price is often not the biggest factor in making a purchase. But that's not always the case for e-com brands. Well, if you know, like one thing I wanted to point out about uh, movement is that, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. And so movement mm -hmm. is, they're, they're one of those brands that shows up in podcasts. They tend to sponsor a lot of these shows that I listen to. And one of their major selling points is comparing the quality of their brand to the overpriced products in the watch industry. So they're disruptive. They're, they're saying you don't need to pay this much for an expensive watch. Now, there is a little bit of like half truth to that. Like a lot of luxury brands can be overpriced, but I've been in the watch industry. I've a, a lot of the sales jobs I've had, I've worked and sold watches and some luxury mm -hmm. watches. And there is a lot of additional work that goes into making these things. It's, it's a lot of precision. Yeah. So yeah, there are markups that are higher than well, I think the average markup. But the other point too, is that if you want a nice looking watch uh, that doesn't break the bank, then you can go with movement watches. So I think customers go in already thinking that they're getting better value for a product that they would have to pay more money elsewhere anyways. Yeah, 100%. And und understanding that, that reason why people come to you is super important. But the, the thing is, it's not always possible, especially at the earliest stages of, of, of the business where you're kind of still figuring out what the exact product market fit looks like, who the audience truly is, uh, what the brand personas look like. So it is a process of discovery. And uh, well, uh, just to throw in a couple of ideas here, alternatives to discounts, what we have experimented with uh, pretty successfully include eBooks, guides, and content-based giveaways. These, uh, these tend to work pretty well in utility-driven products where people are coming to the brand to solve a problem, painkillers, basically. It works less effectively for vitamins, like beauty brands. Uh, it doesn't work as well, as far as our tests are telling us. So that's kind of one uh, practical tip that can give away. Fair enough. So that's everything that uh, I can make time for today. I have to say this has been an excellent conversation as anticipated. If there's any last little bit of wisdom or any parting thoughts you want to uh, leave the listeners with, you have the floor one last chance. Don't forget about email as you scale. I mean, a lot, lots of brands just f forget about one of the oldest marketing channels there, there is. Uh, and it, they're literally just leaving about 20 to 30% additional revenue on the table, but not doing it the right way. So yeah, especially this BFCM, it's so important. It's so important. It could easily add an additional 20% to your bottom line if done in the right way. So yeah, definitely spend some time on it, spend some resources on, on email. Uh, it's going to pay off multiple times. And if you're convinced uh, with what was talked about today, it's uh, chronos.agency. That's right. That's C-H-R-O-N-O-S dot agency, no dot com. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, all right, Josh, uh, thanks so much for, for all your time today. And thanks to everybody for listening. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for having me. You might have found this show on many number of platforms. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or right here on Debutify. Whatever the case, if you enjoy this content and want to help us thrive, please Take a few moments to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you think is best. We also want to hear from you. So whether you think you'd be a good guest or want to weigh in on anything related to our show, you can email podcast at debutify.com or connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Finally, this podcast is created by the passionate team at Debutify. If you're ready to take the plunge into e-commerce or are looking to up your game, Head over to Debutify.com and see how it can change your life and the lives of many through what you do next. <laughs>